Hey, hey, knitters. Welcome to episode 162 of the Knitting with Curly podcast. It's actually 162 today. Last week, I thought it was 162, but it was 161. Super important distinctions. I'm so glad we talked about this. I'm your host, Devin Ventry. You can find me online at knittymcpearly.com. I am Nitty McPearly on Instagram. And if you want to email me, I am Devin at knittymcpearly.com. Today, I'm drinking out of my Florida. Where does it say Florida? There it is. Florida cup that was sent to me by Sherry. Whenever I drink out of this cup, I feel very fancy. I have some fizzy water with lemon in it, which is kind of fancy. And it just feels appropriate to the cup. Not to the weather though. It's like 20 degrees outside today, which I kind of love. So. Also, it takes a long time for liquid to come out of it. I think I'm just impatient. Anyway, here we are. Gonna talk about knitting today. Um, I love to pull out my turtlenecks when it's this cold because I really get hot any other time. And I was looking for my Go Lightly sweater this morning suspect that my teenager, my oldest daughter, has stolen it. She says that she didn't. Usually when people say that they didn't steal something and I accuse them of stealing it, usually I just put it down somewhere and I forgot. <laughs> That's a thing in my house. So anyway, couldn't find that one. So I am wearing my Hepburn sweater today. <clears throat> Got all this space. It's a little bit wrinkly, it gets a little wrinkly in the drawer. Uh, but this is a, I love the longer back on it and it's just super comfy. Oh, I was going to wear a blazer. Hold on. Hold on. Let me get the blazer. Blazers are my new favorite thing. I can't tell if these pants are blue or gray, but now with the blazer, they look kind of blue. What do you think? It's a little bit fancy, huh? Oh, yes. Look. I think pairing something like a knitted sweater with a blazer, in addition to being warm, it's also like super fancy. Now I want to like start the podcast over with my blazer on. I feel so fancy. I, I think these pants are blue. They might be red. Anyway, what do you think? Blazer with a knitted sweater? Yes. So fun. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I wear all the time is my flux cowl. I wear this thing, like anytime I need to look nice, but I also want to be warm, I wear this cowl. I have a cowl that was, um, I'll show it to you. <laughs> this, is gonna, this is weird. Is this weird? I don't know. This is like my legit dresser. But this cowl for years and years was my go-to, I'm getting dressed up cowl. And it's, this is a Plymouth yarn pattern, and I don't know what this yarn is. It might be Plymouth too. Uh, it's like a capelet kind of thing, but I would always wear it as a cowl. And this yarn has some sparkle. I don't, you really can't see it. It also has a lot of pills because it's like 10 years old. But because it is white and because it is alpaca, uh, whoops and a little bit sparkly. It just looks really fancy. So for years and years, this was my go-to, but it has been replaced by the Flux, which reminds me, I wanted to show you, I can't remember if I showed you this last week or not. I think I did, but I'm gonna show it again. Here is the Jovis. It's hard to see. It's hard to show things on camera. It's, anyway, here, what if I kill all the light? Oh, still, still, white just reflects a lot of light. Weird. Anyway, this is the Jovis in Dresden DK, which would make an amazing flux cowl. If I had a million hours to spare, I would make all the things. But one of the things I would make is another flux cowl in the Jovis colorway. <laughs> okay, progress in shop news. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, I have a new color, a new Nitty McPurly color called Jovis. This is the only one that I brought up, uh, but it is a beautiful cream colored white that is so gorgeous. 
And white is hard. You know, it's like black. <laughs> There's a million shades of it. Like try and pick a color of white for your walls. My walls don't look white right now because of the way the light's coming in, but this is a paint color called Greek Villa. Interesting. Jovis, which was an actual Greek villa. Oh my gosh, just put that together just now. Makes sense though. Greek villas were white, right? Um, but it's just a warm white. Whites can be kind of institutional, like asylum y. <laughs> and so you have to have enough warmth in there for it to be kind of friendly. So that is my new color. And with that, I dyed up January's color of the month, which has Jovis as its background. That's the background color. Now this is alpaca and this is wool, so it's gonna take a little bit differently, but, uh, and then it has just beautiful speckles about it. We've got the fingering weight and the DK weight. And you can also get the fingering weight as a sock set with this fabulous addition on the side there. What do you think of that? So if you want that, go over to the website. That stuff is available now. Just about everything else that is going on right now is not available yet. So this is going to be a short segment today. Uh, but I do have winter balm coming very soon that is in the mimosa cardamom scent. Which when you think of mimosa, I mean I think of orange juice and champagne. That's what I think of when I think of mimosa, but it's actually a flower. So it's a really beautiful fancy, perfumey kind of smell. It's really, really pretty. I hope you guys like it. So if you um, subscribe to the newsletter, that will it will go up this week and you can go pick some up then. I also have Valentine's Day kits coming, which is really exciting. I've not done that before because I normally do the Lent calendar. But this year, the thing about the Valentine's Day kit is it's as much fun as the Lent calendar. It's just sized down. And it's a a much more affordable price point, and I think you guys are really gonna like it. There's a lot coming up, basically. I've been working on my spring sweater pattern, which I've decided to hold off on showing you just yet, other than to tell you that it's a duster. It's coming along really well. I love it, I can't wait to wear it. I would like to wear it right now, but with a duster, it takes a lot of knitting. So, still working on that. Also, I'm in the beginning stages of retreat planning. If you are interested in attending a Nitty McPurly retreat, as of right now, it's looking like a year from now, January of, of 25, we're going to have one. So follow along, watch the podcast, subscribe to the newsletter, and you'll hear about it as soon as it's available. So excited about that. Okay, this week's topic of the week. Again, it's kind of a mishmash. We're going to uh, do some follow-up on the needle storage and um, just I have a few other little tidbits I want to talk about. I got a couple other tips about needle storage. This tip I thought was super interesting, something I never would have thought of, but if your husband is a fisherman, you might think of it. Mine is not. My husband does not fish. This tip is from Lisa, who is heart to heart knitting. And she says, this is a bait binder from Cabela's. And you can see she's got the remote in there to give you an idea about how big it is. Because in the pictures, it doesn't look very big, but it really is a good size. It's not like full size binder, uh, but it's got a handle so you can take it places. She said it was $19.99 and she got it for free because her husband had points. Didn't even know Cabela's did points. Uh, we're big Cabela's fans, but I don't know. My husband does all the points. Maybe he has points. Maybe I'll go pick up a bait binder for, for free on points. <laughs> she says it zips. So it zips all the way around. It's got a hard cover and you can add more bags. I got out my label maker and added the sizes and some cord lengths. It has a zippered pouch in the front and a large lip around the entire thing makes for no fallout. Each bag is a Ziploc. I have had this for eight years. It's portable and even has a handle on the top. And then she says, I do have three sets of interchangeables, which of course I leave in their original case. But then she says, now that my husband knits, when he needs a needle, this is what I hand him. 
Your husband knits? How many of you have husbands who knit? How many of you are knitting husbands who are watching this channel? I can see like, you know, based on the information you have given YouTube, I can see what the demographics of who watch the podcast are, and it's 98% women. And I told my husband that, he goes, the other 2% are just watching on their husband's profile. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, anyway, love when husbands knit. I remember my dad telling me that he knew a guy who was a surgeon back in the day, and he would knit. And it was, it was like a, you know, dexterity kind of a thing. And it was like good practice. So you never know. I mean, women can be surgeons too. It's just interesting that women tend to knit more than men, but I love when men knit. That's awesome. Um, another podcast watcher named Susie, hi Susie, sent me this picture from Etsy. And this is similar to the one that I showed last week of a needle holder. And she says it's pretty, so she hangs it up and it's a part of the decor. So that's always nice, you know, if you have something that looks nice, but is also functional, that is great. Uh, another podcast watcher named Karen sent me this, what I thought was a hilarious video. <laughs> I don't know if it was meant to be hilarious. I think it was, but it's a little serious. It's a little independent short film. It's like nine minutes long and there's no talking in it the whole time. And it's this husband and wife and he exerts this tyranny over her, especially in the form of knitting. And this is the part that I found really interesting. Like what he wants is for her to sit there and knit for him. And he gives her the pattern and he gives her the yarn and she just has to sit there and knit. And I'm like, that sounds all right. <laughs> I think I could do it. <laughs> uh, but then in the end, in the end, she gets her revenge on him. So if you have nine minutes to spare and you wanna watch a really silly video that apparently won a lot of awards, at these independent film festivals. I'm not sure what the criteria are for winning awards, but the name of the video is Wool. I'll link it down below if you're interested in that. It was just really silly. Interestingly enough, the book that I am currently reading is also called Wool. It is a fiction book. It's a dystopian future book. And uh, it's not like a morally edifying book, but it's really enjoyable. It's written by Hugh Howey, and it's the first book of a trilogy. It doesn't really have all that much to do with wool. I kind of wonder why he chose that title. It does, it, wool comes in like at the beginning, and then it's like he decided to let that go, but he kept the title. I don't know. It's a good book though. Interesting. All right, moving on to the comment section. Eight Gammy says, I was loving this video so much. She's talking about last week's podcast. And then it got better. Charlotte and her demo, and then Gigi with her film bomb, dancing, laughing. Oh boy, I was loud joining in. And my dog came over to see if I was okay, LOL. I said, never been better. Loved Tammy's story. I relate to many of her life's events. Cheating husband and losing a dear sister at the young age of 30. That was almost 40 years ago, and it still hurts like it was new. On to a lighter note, colder weather is coming to us and possible snow this Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We are at a lower elevation, so we'll see how it pans out. Um, I hope you got it, Gammy. We really did not. We had possible snow too, and it was a whole lot of nothing. Um, but we're hoping, it looks like Tuesday of this coming week, we might get some snow. Charlotte's downstairs right now, cutting out snowflakes and sticking them to the glass door. <laughs> this is what we have come to. Wendy M says, hi, Devin, happy new year. I organize my needles almost exactly the way you do, but I use plastic report cover sleeves and I just wrote the needle size on each cover. I just drop them into the sleeve when I'm finished with them. I keep a sizing tool inside as well because sometimes I drop them into the wrong pocket. I keep my sets in their original cases as well. So they're open on the top, Wendy, and you just keep it upright. See, that would never work for me. <laughs> there is a 100% chance that I would dump it <laughs> and then they'd be in a pile once again. That's There's no like, maybe I would dump it. No, no, I would definitely dump it. I'm going to need some clarity on that. Like, is it open at the top? 
because a report cover, you just slide it in. It doesn't have any kind of a closure. Let me know. And then she says, also, I can only imagine how hard it is to dye a white yarn because it's nearly impossible to pick a white paint for walls. There are so many shades. Exactly. The, the difficulty in, in dyeing white yarn is so nuanced. Anytime you're only adding a small amount of dye, you have to be careful to get it even. It has to come out, you know, even though it's a hand dye and you want a little bit of variety, you still need even coverage. Um, but also you need dye that will remove those yellow undertones that undyed wool has. Undyed wool is ugly in my humble opinion and I don't like it. So I really, it took me a long time to, to get it just the way I wanted. Okay. Irish Bell says, we have knitting looms in our house too. My oldest who can knit and crochet had one from a kit she received years ago. She loves using the smaller one for quick baby hats and a couple larger ones that work well for bigger hats and scarves. She's currently working on a two color scarf. We found that bulky yarn works best to create a full fabric. She says she likes it because it goes faster than regular knitting for her. Awesome. I had another commenter and I meant to go back to it and then I forgot who said she explained that we were doing it wrong with the wrapping, that you don't have to wrap every round. I don't know. I mean, I literally put like the amount of effort you saw me put into it last week. That's how much effort I put into it. I'm not that interested. Uh, you know, once you're a knitter and you you have the skills, the, the loom is more like for a kid or for somebody who just wants to do that. But I thought it was cool because I had seen them before and I didn't know how it worked. So uh, Karen Davis says, amen to Tammy's story. So thankful Jesus is there through the hard times and the good times. As you were reading the comment about the lost needle retrieved by a dedicated husband and the stitch markers left for archaeologists for the future, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to hear all the interesting places we have lost stitch markers? Places I have lost stitch markers. This is Karen. She says, middle school classrooms, in the church pew, around the campfire in the dark, down in the couch cushions, amen, everybody's got them in the couch cushions, under the seat in the truck, yes, in the cleavage of my bra, <laughs> in the bushes off my front porch, in the reclining seat at the movie theater, and so on and so on. Stitch markers are definitely a disposable commodity, amen. And there are some that are more expensive than others and some that are nicer than others. So sometimes it is painful when you lose like a special one. So it's nice to have a lot that aren't special so that you can kind of keep those special ones. I thought I had my necklace on, I, I had it on earlier, but um, like those are special, like I don't wanna lose those, but they're also big enough that you can see them when you drop them. That's really a big part of dropping them and not getting them back. Um, but yeah, where haven't we dropped stitch markers? The I think most of mine are either, we used to have a fluffy rug, like a shag rug. Oh my gosh. You could, you would lose so much stuff in there. You pick it up and shake it and just stuff would fly out of it. And you're like, how is that in there? But stitch markers, <clears throat> couch cushions in the, in the car, especially. I lose them in the car a lot when my husband's driving. I don't knit while driving, but I do sit in the car and wait for kids to come out of something and I'm knitting then, so. Okay, uh, Diane says, I am on team snack size baggie and index card to organize my needles. Of course, there is that pesky returning them to their place issue. I had to laugh that your dad has so many unread emails. With over 105,000 unread emails, yes, you read that correctly, I have the practice <laughs> of telling people, that if you email me, send me a text so that I read the email. <laughs> That's hilarious. I would totally say something like that. <laughs> I kind of have. Like if you email me and you don't hear back, hear back email me again. <laughs> oh gosh, that's hilarious. So my mom texted me after last week's podcast and she said, J people put stuff away and P people don't. So if you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs, where it's four letters and each letter is a toggle. Introvert, extrovert, two other ones, and then J and P. I'm an ENFP. 
So that last letter is either J or P. I think it's judging and perceiving. The judgers are the put awayers. If you are always putting a thing in its place, you're probably a J person. If you're like me and you're like, I don't know, <laughs> I can't remember what I did with it. It's here somewhere. You're probably a P person. All right, moving right along to knitting fantasies. I love everything about the 50s. I'm not like a period dresser. Like, you know how people like get excited about a decade and so that they, they dress like fully in that decade? I think for me, that's a little too far, but I love the 50s in terms of style and decorum. It's funny, as I was prepping this podcast, my non-knitting friends and I had a text thread going and one my one friend said, what's up with these people who film themselves at the gym? And my other friend said, at my gym, they set up tripods and lights and film themselves working out. <laughs> and I was like, see, this is what I'm talking about. This is the decor, like that wouldn't happen in the 50s. First of all, so, so much of that just would not happen in the 50s, okay? I, my kids and I have taken to watching Father Knows Best. This is, this was like a tangent from Andy Griffith because Eleanor Donahue started out in Father Knows Best and we know her from Andy Griffith. So we went back and started watching that. And Jane Wyatt, who plays the mom in the family, is like my style hero. She, she is, and my mom hero. Of course she's fictional. You know, this, it's a fictional family. Whenever my family's like, look what they do. I'm like, yeah, well, they're fictional. They have a script. We don't. Uh, but it's a it's a cute little show. It's a little sugary because everything in the fifties that was like public was a little bit sugary. But um, yeah, everything that everything Jane Wyatt wears, I'm like, oh, I just love it. So I found a couple of vintage patterns from the fifties. Now the downside to vintage patterns is that everyone in the fifties was built like Jane Wyatt. I don't know how they managed it, but they somehow did. So this jacket, look at how gorgeous this whole picture is. Everything about this picture is stunning and beautiful and classy and just sophisticated. So this picture is of the late day abbreviated jacket. I think that means cropped, uh, but your belly doesn't show. You don't have your belly hanging out. It's just classy. So this late day abbreviated jacket is knit in a yarn that luckily the people who are selling this pattern on Etsy have looked up that yarn and they're like, it's a sport weight. So that's helpful. Uh, it comes in five sizes. Are you ready to hear what they are? 30, 32, 34, 36, and 38. <laughs> so if you fit into that very small range of sizes, I mean, preteens, are a 30 inch bust whenever I'm, you know, like it's just such a, t it's tiny, tiny, tiny. So it only comes in a few sizes, but I imagine that if you were motivated, you could probably extrapolate it into bigger sizes. Um, but I just think it is so gorgeous. So this, I forget what it is. I, I didn't write it down, but I'll link it. I'll link it down below. The Etsy seller has somehow gotten the rights to these patterns and they're just, you know, selling you digital copies of these original patterns. <laughs> How about this one? I love this one. I love everything about this. She is perfect. She's completely pulled together. She's lost all the baby weight. <laughs> Here she is holding the baby, bo baby bottle like, yep, mm -hmm, I just had a baby five minutes ago. And this sweater is a bed jacket. It's crocheted. I think it's beautiful. It only comes in one size that they call medium, <clears throat> but apparently this is medium. And this woman is tiny. So it's tiny, but I think it's really cute. It's really, really pretty. Again, I haven't looked at the actual pattern, but it, it's feasible that it could possibly be adapted to uh, bigger sizes. 
Uh, I have two more vintage picks. I went a little crazy on Knitting Fantasies picks today. This is the vintage convertible blouse, which is very cool. I think this is really, really pretty. Um, I love it. It's got like a pico edge and it's off the shoulder. I think if I were to make it, I don't know how it's constructed, but I would want it just to have a strap on one side. I don't think I would take the shoulder all the way down or you could take it all the way down in a long sleeve. That would be very dramatic. It's really, really pretty. I like that a lot too. And finally, this is a 50s shrug. This is fingering weight. Looks like it would knit up really quickly. This is also available in only one size. So again, you know, a shrug, it doesn't fit fit, like it doesn't have to fit fit. It looks like there's a good bit of ease in there and then it kind of comes in at the sleeve. But again, the model is very, very slim. So those are my picks for what it's worth. Okay, so here's what happened. Uh, thank you. Many of you have been sending me your knitting stories. So this is a weekly podcast. Uh, if you're new, by the way, subscribe. That would be awesome. Give me a thumbs up and come back next Sunday because I am here every single week. Uh, this is from a lovely knitter named Adela Horakova. If I have mispronounced that, Adela, I apologize. She's from the Czech Republic and her name has three accent marks in it and I'm not sure what to do with them. <laughs> so um, hopefully I did not butcher it. Interestingly, uh, my ancestry is kind of Eastern European mutt. It's, you know, Germany and uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. And uh, my maiden name is Pesta, and that's a Czech name. So my dad's, dad's family came from um, Czechoslovakia. Adela says, Hi, Devin. Finally, I'm sitting down to share a knitted related story with you. I love other knitters' stories you tell on your podcast so much, and I promise myself to share a knitting story with you too to give back a little. I really love your podcast and all the thought you put in all you do and share so generously with us, your viewers. Thank you so much, Adela. She speaks English super well too, by the way. I would never know from reading this that it's not her first language. So here's what happened. I come from the Czech Republic and I learned how to knit when I was about nine or 10 years old. Back in the 1980s, still during the communist regime, the only way for us to get a sweater was to knit one. My mom taught me the basics when I was 11 and I decided to knit my first sweater. I figured out all you need to do is knit four rectangles and sew them together. I gathered some leftover <clears throat> or repurposed yarn that we had at home and mom told me to knit a swatch and taught me how to take measurements and calculate how many stitches I needed to cast on, etc. Eventually, I think I also learned how to do the neckline, and sure enough, I did make my first ever sweater. I still remember it was dark gray with white and green stripes. I wore it proudly for as long as it fitted. Unfortunately, I only have one black and white photo of myself wearing it, where you actually can't even see the sweater very well, but I can recognize it in the picture. Since that first sweater, I knit many, many more. When I was in high school, I even made a little money from time to time knitting sweaters for other people. My knitting was a little slower during my university studies, mainly because I did so much reading that it took nearly all of my downtime. I did not knit too much when my children were very little either. However, about seven years ago, I rediscovered my passion for knitting when I found Ravelry and all the yarns that you can these days. I also discovered the many wonderful knitting podcasts and the international knitting community. It's a wonderful thing to connect with people from all over the world this way. It super is. Just a brief aside on that, uh, I have a friend, she's my age, but she's just gone back to get her master's. And she was telling me that textbooks these days are all, you can get all of them on audiobook. I was like, do you know how much knitting you could get done if you listen to audiobooks? I'm a huge audiobook fan because I don't have time to sit and read. But if I'm doing other things, I can listen to an audiobook. And now to my little story. She says, this spring, my husband went on a white water kayaking trip with his friends in Corsica, which is a French island in the Mediterranean. Oh my gosh, that sounds like so much fun. 
When they arrived, he realized he was missing an important little part of equipment he needed. And his friend, who was also a kayaking instructor, told him they could try and find something at a place where an Austrian canoeing kayaking school he knew had their permanent canoe storage place on the island. They went there, got the piece of equipment. My husband contacted them via Instagram asking whether he could borrow the thing. And sure enough, they replied and then he just returned it at the end of the week. So a week later, he comes back to return the item and he took a picture of himself putting the thing back with a bottle of wine as a thank you. He sent the picture to them via Instagram and almost immediately received a reply from a person called Anne. She wrote to him, thank you for returning the item and letting us know. And by the way, are you wearing a Marled Mania sweater by Stephen West? His reply was, wow, yes, my wife is an avid knitter and she made it for me. So Anne says, well, I'm a knitter too. Your sweater looks wonderful. Say hi to your wife. That's awesome. So he did. Later, I contacted Anne to say hello and connected with her on Instagram. And although we have not been in touch since then, it was such a funny and heartwarming little story for me. So she sent me a link to her Ravelry page of the sweater. So here is a picture of that. Uh, I just think that's great. I'm always surprised that that doesn't happen more. I think I've, I've told this story on the podcast before, but Carista, hi Carista, of Wyoming Yarn was at my retreat and, and she taught a session and she got up and she held up this amazing Stephen West shawl. You know how his shawls are. I mean, they're amazing. I can't remember if she held it up or if she was wearing it, but she was like, I walked through the entire airport and no one said anything to me. And we like gave her a standing ovation because we were like, we love it. It's so good. But that's just funny. Like how are there not, there's a million knitters. Where are the knitters when you need them? If you're wearing something made, designed by Stephen West, you need knitters out there to go, I know that sweater or I know that shawl. Love it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adela. That was a wonderful story from very, very far away. Never been to Eastern Europe. I've never been a lot of places, but I really hope to go sometime. I would love to go to the Czech Republic. Um, like I said, this is a weekly podcast and I need stories. So send me your knitting story. I would love to share it on the podcast. Uh, I don't know if this has been a little, it's a little bit short today, but that's okay. It takes me less time to edit and uh, I can get back to some knitting and sitting on the couch. Now that the Christmas season is pretty much over, we've had to find other things to watch. We'll probably watch some Father Knows Best. <laughs> Have a wonderful week. I hope you get a lot of extra knitting time in and hopefully you get some snow too. I know some of you are like, please don't wish snow on me. I live in Northern Canada and I don't want any more snow, but I would like some snow. I was promised snow this year and I will have it, <laughs> even if it's just paper <laughs> hung on the window. All right, guys, see you next week. Bye, knitters.